uh, main reason for a the, the collapse of civilization is annual agriculture. So, of course, a key point for a regenerative uh, agriculture, and I call it here a regenerative biodynamic agriculture, because biodynamic agriculture as um, an agriculture that takes into consideration uh, not just the soil, not just um, the, the things that grow on the soil, but also takes into consideration the forces and processes that happen within the soil and within the cosmos. Welcome to Anthroposophical Conversations, the podcast where we explore the transformative teachings of Rudolf Steiner and engage in insightful discussions with individuals studying anthroposophy. Thomas Linders is a highly experienced expert in biodynamic agriculture, recognized internationally as one of the water sages with a deep love for nature, focusing on developing best practice models. He was invited to the Johannesburg Group of the Anthroposophical Society to give a talk exploring biodynamic farming and sharing how Wayport Farm is developing a model for rural regeneration. This is a recording of the presentation he gave. Please enjoy. Well, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Those that braved the weather and came out here and uh, welcome to those that uh, join us uh, online. It's a new experience for me. Um, so give me a little bit of um, a leeway here. Um, I'm going to bring you a little bit um, uh, something of my life. Um, at, this will not just it will not be a presentation about how to how to go farming. Um, it will bring a little bit of what we've been up to um, over the last couple of years. Um, so most of the presentation is coming through the looking glass of biodynamics, the biodynamic agriculture. It's not a lecture on biodynamic agriculture. It is part of what I'm going to bring. Um, it is also, I'm going to bring something around permaculture. I'm going to bring something around uh, regenerative agriculture. And of course, I will bring this through the lens of my biography. Um, my life is rooted in anthroposophy. I was privileged enough to be born into um, this uh, great work of, um, of spiritual science um, in Switzerland. As you can hear, I still can't uh, speak properly, although I've been living here since 1987. Um, I my roots are obviously my my uh, original roots are in uh, in Switzerland, um, but uh, this is my home. So, um, you saw this poster, um, and there's a lot of big words in there, and uh, I will um, try to uh, do it justice to go through all of this. Um, I will talk a little bit about our vision of Whitewood Farm, um, the reasons for a regenerative agriculture. Um, uh, and, but I will first start with giving a bit of a glum picture of where the world is today in terms of uh, agriculture. Um, uh, because that might highlight why a place like Whitewood Farm is important. Um, so, let me share the, a couple of thoughts first on, um, as, as a foundation perhaps, um, um, for this presentation. So, one thing to remember, of course, is that we're all involved in agriculture. 
I don't think any one of you here today and uh, over the ether hasn't eaten. Um, and so because we have to feed our bodies, we are intimately involved in agriculture and we have almost a duty um, to encourage an agriculture um, that will support our body in the way so that it can support our um, feeling processes and our thought process. So, as I just said, we're all intimately involved in agriculture. So unless we look at some of our um, uh, preconceived ideas critically, nothing is going to change. So um, there's this wonderful uh, word about uh, cognitive dissonance. And one of the reasons I think why biodynamics, after having been around for a hundred years, almost a hundred years, next year is the hundredth anniversary of the founding of biodynamic agriculture through the agricultural course by Rudolf Steiner, uh, one of the reasons I think why it is still so obscure is because um, uh, what we could call cognitive dissonance. Um, so our minds involuntarily reject information that, that is contrary to our beliefs. So I could tell you a lot about um, uh, agriculture, talk, talk to you about the soil, I can talk to you about the microbes, and you might all get very interesting about the food. But suddenly I start talking about the influence of Jupiter and um, Aquarius, and your, your shutters go down. Perhaps not many of you here in the, in the audience that regularly come to, to the Rudolf Steiner Center here, um, but generally, uh, suddenly something that's out of one's uh, real um, everyday life and we reject it immediately. So I ask you for the next hour and a bit to perhaps um, uh, let, the, let me share or maybe let me um, uh, shake some of those beliefs and, uh, and it might be a very fruitful experience for us all. So, what are the issues with modern agri industrial agricultural systems? We know that the Earth's deserts grow very rapidly every year. So, um, uh, you know, even if it's not a, a desert like, for example, the Sahara or, um, or uh, um, other great deserts all around. Basically, what we have in, in industrial agriculture are deserts because they support very little life. Um, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, by 2025, uh, a vast majority of uh, people in the world ha will have will have not if, uh, enough water to grow food. Um, and not have water for their basic needs. The water table is being depleted. I mean, here in this area, it's, uh, it's very evident as well. I, when I first moved here to um, the, the, the Johannesburg area, we had boreholes that maybe, you know, you hit water at about 30 meter, and now you're going down almost 100 meter further uh, until you strike water. Um, and of course, a lot of that has to do um, uh, uh, with agriculture, because we don't have a conservation agriculture, we, um, uh, we waste a huge amount of water. So, the reality is that most farming destroys the soil and the soil building system. Um, and that is for... 50 to 84 percent of sustainable agriculture as well. Um, so it's not that when you buy organic food um, that you that necessarily this is a is a soil conserving of or a regenerative organic agriculture. Very often, as I just said, 
a vast uh, majority is um, a depleting agriculture, even though it is labeled organic. Um, because very often we're just importing fertility from somewhere else um, and depleting soils uh, in another um, on, on another farm. So we will run out of farmable soil uh, very quickly, and that's why you'll see if you if you read a lot of it is being. Uh, uh, Promoted is uh, hydroponic farming, farming in containers, farming uh, on the moon, uh, on Mars, on uh, uh, underground, uh, because uh, the reality is that we run out of soil. But one, of course, leads the question: what uh, what food quality uh, do these crops have? They might look very nice, but the the, the quality, the nutrition is questionable. So, like in many uh, countries around the world, South African uh, agriculture's main export is soil. We're losing between three and five tons per acre every year through wind erosion, through water erosion. And we see that very nicely, well, nicely. We, uh, it, it's an extreme case, really, where a lot of our um, orange free state soil, the orange soils of the free state, get washed down the Caledon and then down the, the Orange River and go out uh, into the Atlantic uh, at the border of Namibia and, and, and South Africa. In fact, I've heard it say that um, there is such a big mountain of topsoil outside the, the Orange River mouth there um, that it's, it, well, it is a... Uh, almost a new feature within the ocean ocean there um, uh, that that's been uh, brought there by the by the rivers. Um, yeah, so there are other and those things are just called externalities. You know, they're not really factored into the economic system of agriculture. So if we look at the true cost accounting for agriculture. Industrial agriculture is standing at a very bad, in a very bad light. Um, there are some other externalities. Um, there's the agrochemical pollution, there's species extinction. Um, there is a drastic reduction in nutrient density of our food. We are still um, uh, looking at uh, agricultural success in yield um, in tons per hectare rather than in the nutrient density um, of, of our food. If we would do that, um, most farms would fare very poorly. So, and we spend way more calories to bring the food to our dinner table than we actually eating. Um, so the average food mile here in South Africa is about one and a half thousand kilometers. So, um, that uh, um, is uh, is a frightening thing. Um, but one of the most important so-called externalities for me is uh, is the human health and what it does um, to uh, to public health. Um, we know that healthcare costs all around the world um, uh, <coughs> have skyrocketed. Um, because there is no, we, we, again, we, we're not looking at um, what um, uh, a chemical that we're spraying onto food, um, that that might have an impact for the people that are eating it afterwards. There's increasing evidence uh, showing the direct links between the industrialization of our agriculture and food. Oops. Oh, no. Sorry, <laughs> our food systems are the rapid rise uh, of a range of diseases which are now resulting in increasingly unaffordable treatment costs. Um, and these, of course, include the so-called uh, diet-related illnesses such as obesity, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, allergies, cancers, and many diseases of the immune system. Um, uh, are linked to our uh, the, the quality of our food. 
Um, and for uh, especially uh, Parkinson's disease is directly related to 11 commonly used pesticides. If I'm in your way, you must just uh, show me to move away. Um, we might understand this whole thing about uh, the, the pesticides and herbicides a little bit better if we look at what is called the Shikamate pathway. I don't know how many of you have heard about this. Um, but basically, um, uh, the primary, so glyphosate is a herbicide um, that kills plants um, by inhibiting an enzyme, um, which is part of the biochemical pathway uh, known as the Shik Shik Shikimate pathway. So we always thought glyphosate was safe to use because humans don't have a Shikimate pathway. It's only um, plants, fungi, and bacteria. Um, but glyphosate has a huge impact on our human microbiome, on our, our gut system. And more and more that comes out how um, also uh, how there is this incredible link between our big brain and our little brain, the big brain being our gut. Um, and, uh, and how our gut health has influences directly how our uh, brain and our our mind functions. Um, so, what glyphosate does is that it disrupts um, um, uh, amino acids, um, uh, the, the uptake of amino of essential amino acids in the plant system, and um, and therefore the plant cannot. Um, uh, uh, produce um, the the very important protein structures that then will feed us. In fact, this is a, a, a wonderful uh, little YouTube series. Uh, after school, they make a beautiful um, graphic uh, type YouTube um, with the, a, a very va vast um, uh, range of, of topics. And of course, Zach Bush being such a a wonderful um, fight for regenerative agriculture in America and all over the world um, has uh, uh, brought this uh, this uh, the loss of human health uh, through chemical farming uh, brought a, a beautiful presentation uh, here. So um, to round off this a uh, little bit of doom and gloom section, I want to highlight. Uh, what I believe, or we believe, in the regenerative agricultural fraternity um, is the real problem of our modern agriculture. And that includes most forms of agriculture, again, not just um, chemical farming, and that is that the, the main problem is annual agriculture. Most of our crops are annual crops. Um, and in order for annual crops to plant, permanent systems had to be destroyed. So we either had to had to destroy a forest system, or we had to destroy a, um, a grasslands um, to then grow an annual crop. Um, and uh, and yeah, the, there is huge land mass that has been gone gone through uh, through these changes. Um, so we'll see that all the cultures that relied on annual agriculture, they disappeared uh, very quickly. They followed basically what a, um, uh, an annual crop does um, that has a quick um, growth spurt, produces lots of mass and food value, and then collapses. Um, and very often, um, you know, once there's one crop um, uh, harvested, uh, a land stands fallow uh, for months on end. And through that time, it doesn't provide any ecological uh, function, like, for example, wildlife habitat, uh, water cleaning services, carbon sequestration. That's not there. That's so in the non growing season, there's this vast landscape um, that. Uh, are basically deserts. So, in the words of Roger Savory, 26 major civilizations have failed due to the collapse of agriculture. 
How arrogant would we be to presume the root cause of our collapse won't be the exact same thing? So this should give us pause to think and, and perhaps look at that there might be other ways of uh, nourishing ourselves. So how do we get out of this dilemma? How do we get balanced climate, fresh water, fertile soil? Yes, you probably guessed right. Through the transition, uh, transitioning into a regenerative agriculture system. And the encouraging thing about regenerative agriculture and nature is that it can happen very quickly. Nature is incredibly um, forgiving, and we can um, uh, we can um, uh, with with the right uh, em emphasis and impetus uh, turn around um, agricultural lands very quickly. Um, so. We often hear of, hear of course, um, about sustainable agriculture. It's a real buzzword. Um, but really, we don't want to sustain what we have at the moment. So we have a very um, degenerative um, uh, agricultural system at the moment, as we've uh, just heard. So we need to regenerate those um, agricultural systems in order for that to then sustain that um, regenerated land. Um, so we don't want sustainability now, really. We want regeneration. Um, so, as we just heard, the uh, main reason for a, the, the collapse of civilization is annual agriculture. So, of course, a key point for a regenerative uh, agriculture, and I call it here a regenerative biodynamic agriculture, because biodynamic agriculture as um, an agriculture that takes into consideration uh, not just the soil, not just um, the, the things that grow on the soil, but also takes into consideration the forces and processes that happen within the soil, and within the cosmos, I'll bring about uh, bring the, the planets into the play again, and the and, and the zodiac, and um, we will talk a little bit uh, later around that again. So we have to move from a purely annual cropping system to focus more on perennial systems. Um, our main work must be to grow soil. It's not to grow plants or animals. It is really to regenerate soil. Um, because with growing soil, we grow, we, we increase the soil organic matter. And, and, and it is tiny fractions of the soil that are actually the organic matter in there. Um, organic matter being um, uh, anything that was once alive and has now uh, decomposed and is, becomes part of the mineral part of the soil. Um, so if we just add, increase our soil organic matter by 1%, um, it holds suddenly 10 times more water than if there's no organic matter in the soil. If, it, if we increase it to 2%, it holds 10 times 10 times more water, so 100 times more water than before. So clearly, um, we can, uh, um, these, uh, uh, just increasing organic matter will take us through drought, grow more biomass, and, uh, and start a real virtuous perpetual cycle. Um, the fourth point really is to put uh, in woody crops, our perennials. Um, we look closely at the biomes where we are um, and then try to emulate that with um, plants that, uh, uh, that are an equivalent uh, to those biomes. Um, these are some pictures of uh, forest farm in, in America. Uh, Mark Shepherd is a real wonderful proponent of um, uh, of forest, agroforestry, you could say, um, and he's really turned around a, a completely depleted maize farm into this uh, this haven 
uh, of a, um, a multi-cropped um, farm. Mm -hmm. So even within uh, with between three and five years, we can get uh, our 2% soil organic matter up uh, and then bring in a let the, the woody crops, of course, always take a little longer, um, uh, but uh, um, they very soon uh, start with the whole um, carbon sequestration and bringing about a, a, a healthy soil microbiome. Because you see, the, the, the plants, um, the, the real work is really done by the microorganisms around a plant's roots. And um, the, the, the whole process of photosynthesis, so changing our utilizing sunlight um, and changing um, uh, carbon, uh, carbon and water uh, into sugars, um, the, the, the plant exudes almost 40% of that through their root system into the soil and thus supports the micro organisms within that soil that then again they are then the miners of the mineral fraction within the soils um, and uh, and make available uh, many of the minerals that otherwise would have been locked up. Um, so with this as a little bit of a background, um, a group of us found our way to the Free State to find our forever home there. Why? You might wonder, would we end up in a place like this? So, just as a reminder for myself, I will share a little bit why, uh, what our um, our raison d'être is there, um, and uh, uh, and the role that biodynamics and regenerative agriculture plays within our system. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, a little bit of our uh, past, present, and future. So basically, we found a very, you don't have to read it all, this is all a bit, um, <laughs> a bit long. Um, we founded a, a, a non profit organization called Sustainable Community Development um, because we wanted, to, wanted this not to be a, um, um, a a personal for-profit uh, system, but a uh, to create create uh, models of sustainability on this uh, beautiful planet through a a um, well a, a, an NGO system. Um, we have a for-profit organization on the farm as well. Um, we have. Uh, we, we, we moved on to the farm in 2015 uh, to really see if we can um, really um, uh, experiment and work the farm and make it make it work for us and for the communities that what that we went uh, there for. Um, and it was lucky that I mean there's um, uh, Vipke actually um, that's sitting here in the audience. Uh, nudged me to um, ask her uh, son-in-law to um, perhaps share his beautiful uh, piece of land there in the free state uh, because he wasn't really farming it. So Keith very kindly allowed us for five years to um, work the land and find if we can actually make it work. Um, and gave us that time to also find funding uh, to eventually uh, purchase the farm. But that's a little bit down the road. Um, so the first five years were really a proof of concept. Um, and it gave us the time to look, as I said, for, for funding. And it was one of those um, moments in my biography where we it was like five to twelve, and we still didn't have the money. And we were involved with uh, with other community projects in the northwest, and we were working there with a Buddhist organization called Rockpa International. 
Um, it's a Tibetan uh, Buddhist organization. They have also centers here in Randburg and in, in Kensington. And we were working with their place in Khutmariko, in the um, in the Kelfontaine Valley there. Um, and their center was struggling a little bit. So the the head of um, Rockway International, Lea Vila, she uh, suggested that she uh, that we help that permaculture center there to get uh, going again, and in return she would pay our consulting fee forward basically and buy the farm. So literally we had um, agreed to vacate the farm on the 20th of August, and I think that just in the last days of two, July we received the money um, for. For the, the, the project, so that was quite wonderful. Um, but we never wanted to own the farm or have the farm even owned by the NGO, Sustainable Community Development. We looked at other ways of uh, owning property because you can't really own land. The land is, <laughs> was there before us and and will be long there after us. So we we really wanted to find a system that where we are just stewards for the land. And, uh, uh, and so we we founded a land trust. Um, Paul McCullen in in Cape Town, a, a wonderful environmental lawyer. He um, he pioneered that with a farm in the Cape, uh, Africara. And um, and also has worked with organisations all over the world to put even um, you know rivers into a trust that rivers become their own um, uh, individual identities. Um, so I think he's also in a in a process of doing something like that with Table Mountain. That Table Mountain is becomes almost a legal persona. So. Um, and in that way, uh, we have made sure that uh, Whitewood Farm uh, will, will be in perpetuity um, uh, there for regenerative agriculture and to teach regenerative agriculture. So, but why that far away in the middle of the free state? So, um, so now you, you can see this uh, little yellow dot here. Um, that's where it is, just about 40 kilometers north of Lesotho, of the border there at Fixburg. Um, uh, it's about 350 kilometers straight south from, from here. Um, and I've, for many, many years, uh, even in the, two, in the early 2000s, we've been looking for land in the Free State because we were looking at a mountainous area. Uh, we were looking at uh, clean air, uh, clean water, um, and um, difficult soils. We like to have a little bit of a challenge, um, and uh, and of course somewhere where there is a community of people living already, um, there is the uh, the little farm road involved, um, and next to it. Um, in the big town of Mautze. Um, uh, so, because we're also interested in a different, uh, in, in, dif in, uh, in different economic models. Uh, so we were, we are hoping to really establish a, a bioregional uh, circular economy uh, in this region. And uh, a big part, of course, was that I was quite disillusioned from my work uh, around Johannesburg. Around 20 years, I worked here with NGOs and uh, uh, household food security programs uh, and government programs in, in the townships around Midran. Um, and usually, there, it was like funding for a year. And to start any community project and only have a year to really do something is a waste of time and money. Um, so that's why we thought we'll, we'll create a, a utopia, I guess we could call it, um, and a, um, I guess, uh, what another German word that's used within the English language, uh, Gesamtkunstwerk, which is basically a 
synthesizing all the art into one into one whole. And with arts, of course, we also we're not talking just about the fine arts, but also the arts of uh, working with soils, working with animals, working with people. Um, so, and it is also a very arid area, and that uh, um, uh, we also wanted that as a as a case study, really, um, of how we can be self-sufficient with what we get from above with rain. So, in the words of another hero of mine, um, if governments won't solve the climate hunger, health and democracy crises, then people will. Regenerative agriculture provides answers to the soil crisis, the food crisis, the health crisis, the climate crisis and the crisis of democracy. So, in fact, it is the only solution. Uh, it is individuals and small groups of people that really ma can make a change. So, to share a little bit our um, our pathway, um, this is what we've done. So, first of all, we went about and we studied the land to create what we call a permaculture design. Permaculture uh, is a um, a made-up word uh, from permanence and agriculture, or permanence and culture. And um, it was developed um, by two Australians, Bill Mollison and Dave Holmgren. But ba basically what they did is that they went around all cultures, all climate areas uh, around the whole world and really looked at all the best practice models and created it created a design methodology um, uh, to bring about um, uh, uh, best ways of a human life on this planet. So permaculture is a design methodology and not a, a, a growing method. So it has, um, which is often thought uh, that we say, well, we, we, we're doing permaculture, so we're growing in a certain style, not really what it is. Uh, through the permaculture, we can develop whole systems design. So again, um, uh, that encompass the totality of the human interaction uh, with the world. So there is a whole process that one goes through. One looks at where all the external and internal energies come from, um, because we can either enhance them or we can block them. Uh, if we have too much wind, uh, that can be a good thing if we want to put up a wind farm, but if we want to plant uh, you know, um, a tree crops, they will all be uh, standing lopsided very quickly uh, if we don't have shelter belts. Um, so, um, and um, we look at the outset at what, what, what we call the mainframe designs and those are the things that once they are in place you can't really change them very well so um, in permaculture those mainframe designs are water, access and infrastructure um, so we did of course start with uh, the mainframe design water and uh, we have um, the, the wonderful thing is that water flows downhill, but it always flows at right angles to the contour. Um, and, uh, and of course, we want to catch as much as possible. So um, uh, in, in permaculture, we call it the four, uh, the four S's. We want to slow the water down. We want to spread the water and sink it and store it in the ground. And the more, again, the more um, organic matter we have in the ground, the, the, the longer that water can store in there. And um, so that free rain, uh, we wanted to capture in swales, in dams, in rock bounds, and of course, in the vegetation and the soil. We are lucky enough to have our drinking water supply uh, supplied by springs, but we still uh, harvest rainwater. Um, and We'll talk about the erosion a little bit later on. So, um, I'm very, uh, I've always had great affinity with water. 
In fact, uh, the last time the Lake of Zurich um, was frozen was when my mother carried me in her belly uh, on the lake. Uh, so that was 1963. So uh, things have uh, warmed up a little bit since then and uh, the lake hasn't been frozen. So I did grow up around a lot of water. So water's always been important to me. So the first thing, of course, we did was that we, um, there was a small little puddle, really, a pond, um, and we had a wonderful angel donor right at the beginning, and uh, she gave us the money to create some of those systems. Um, so we um, enlarged that uh, that dam. We um, I did. I was lucky enough to go to Australia and did a, an earthworks design course with the, in the Permaculture Institute with Jeff Lawton, which is, was absolutely fantastic. So that uh, gave me the skills to to work a laser level and really work with uh, with the, the ex excavator operator uh, to do a fantastic job. So here we have a four and a half million liter uh, dam, and of course, 2015 was a drought, yes, so we had pretty little water in that dam. Uh, but um, yeah, patience um, filled it up, patience and rain, but it looked like chocolate sauce. So we had a, um, a wonderful, um, difficult soil they're called a duplex soil, um, meaning that um, there's a very hard clay layer um, and, uh, and it is what's called a dispersive clay, a clay that doesn't settle down. It just sits there in the water. You just have... Uh, um, have chocolate sauce or whatever the clay's color is. So we have one dam that was yellow and one dam that was uh, pink because the clay is that way. Um, but as you said, so earlier on, uh, we did manage to get it clear. And uh, the interesting thing is all, all it took is a couple of bags of gypsum. And that gypsum what? changed gypsum. 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 Yes. Um, that changed the, um, the the electrical charge and that flocculated the, the clay right out. And with the clear water, birds brought in plants and um, and uh, wildlife, and it is now a fantastic um, haven for dozens of uh, birds and uh, uh, um, amphibian species. We of course also planted vegetables and uh, more than erosion control. And it's the interesting thing with vetiver, which is a, um, a uh, not a native grass, uh, but it doesn't make flowers, so it doesn't spread um, uh, via seeds. It only vegetatively expands and uh, creates these incredible clumps. And it can work submerged in water or uh, even in, uh, in very dry. Um, environments. Always important to very quickly plant uh, exposed <coughs> soils, so we use clumping bamboos, uh, never use running bamboos. <laughs> um, I've had a wonderful experience with um, in my mother-in-law's backyard. Um, she got given a beautiful little plant of bamboo and that was planted at the at the edge, and now, I don't know, it's probably half an acre, it's just a bamboo forest. <laughs> um, so you want clumping bamboos that uh, you can harvest nicely. So the next thing was to do um, swales. So, um, but what are swales? So swales really are um, ditches um, on a contour, and whatever we dig out there with our excavator, we put on the, the valley side, um, and we let it loose. It is not compacted, um, and as the rainwater fills um, the uh, the swale, um, it irrigates the this mound, the berm at the bottom, and that is the area where we can then plant uh, trees and vegetation. Um, and it creates this plume of um, 
of moisture in the in the soil, and eventually, of course, it will uh, hit impervious layers. Um, in our case, very quickly because uh, the clay is is right there. Um, and uh, further down the hill, very often you'll find that it, it pushes up uh, and creates a new spring. But in the meantime, it creates this big reservoir and regenerates um, the, um, uh, the groundwater resources at the same time. This is uh, uh, um, a little video that Jeff Lawton uh, uh, produced. Um, a great permaculture uh, teacher that I've also had the privilege of uh, learning with. So, we've had um, a lot of ground to cover uh, of this whale, uh, and the excavator um, was with us for a couple of weeks. Um, and because of those difficult places, we went quite a bit deeper than what one normally would, would do. You can do a swale in your backyard um, just uh, normally when you have uh, uh, little soils um, uh, can be very shallow. Um, but we wanted to go right into the clay layer because that duplex soil also has the, the danger that it's very quickly, uh, that it's very highly erodible. So you find when you go to the zoo to or in those parts of the free state, you run through these incredible erosion landscapes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, on the one hand, it's a natural process. And of course, on the other hand, it is also um, exacerbated with uh, through overgrazing and uh, bad agriculture for those uh, those lands. So again, those swells got quickly vegetated with uh, mostly leguminous and grass plants. Um, and they filled up, and uh, it's a real joy um, to see how, because it is so clay rich, it doesn't see in very well, um, but we basically have kilometers of, um, of waterways, of dams, long, da long thin dams along the, uh, the land. And they're vegetated again, and uh, I'll share a bit about the, the growth a little bit later. Um, the swales also assisted us unexpectedly in some erosion control, uh, which become, became more and more apparent um, over the years. Uh, so yeah, here you can just see the length of the two swale systems that we built. And both swale systems, they lead um, into, into the dam. So there is a small section that goes into the big dam, the four and a half thousand uh, kilometer dam. And there's a long swale that leads into this little dam here. Um, so how did it uh, uh, help us? Oh yeah, so here you can see some of the spectacular road <laughs> that, you, that you find there. And you can see very, very clay. And then at the bottom, all, all the clay that, um, that uh, gets washed out creates those uh, very, very fine dust. So, um, this picture here is before we move on. And you can see there's a big, huge erosion area here. Here's that dam that eventually became 2016 here, this dam. Um, and it interrupted this, um, uh, this, uh, this erosion area. It went straight through there. So in 2019, um, you can see how this erosion has reduced quite drastically. And the recent picture here shows that there's almost no erosion um, uh, visible below that swell. So the swell has done its job. It slowed down the water. It sprayed it and slowly infiltrated into the ground. Erosion happens because uh, of velocity and, and volume of water that's rushing over uh, over the land. Um, so quite naturally, um, the, this uh, picture here shows that uh, rehabilitated uh, piece of erosion 
And I didn't do anything to it. I just put the cars on there, and with their hooves, they uh, created um, uh, little niches where seeds could gather in there with with the the wind, and then the water would fall and create little uh, planting pockets. And uh, that's how um, it all regenerated itself. So this experience with the swells led me to um, uh, uh, share a webinar in, uh, with uh, an American water activist group, um, uh, and uh, also um, I'm doing a poster for the, the Oppenheimer Conservation Research Conference, which is uh, uh, this um, this October, which I'm uh, very excited about. Yeah, I did talk about the uh, the beautiful springs that we have on the farm that uh, nourish us and the animals and the gardens. So, there's water, now infrastructure. I will go quite quickly through here because uh, time's moving on. Uh, so there were some existing buildings uh, that we were able to occupy. Um, uh, we also obviously had to immediately uh, create some form of energy and because uh, there was no ESCOM around, luckily, um, we um, we uh, put in a solar system that still to this day runs all our needs, uh, fridge, washing machine, computers, um, lights, so we are, um, we are well served. We also looked at, uh, of course, uh, cooking with other means uh, and baking, uh, rocket uh, stoves, so a fantastic way of rocket ovens that with, with very little kindling, uh, you can get uh, very high temperatures and, uh, you know, you bake a, a, a bread with a, a 20 liter bucket full of, of thin little sticks, so it hardly uses any any fuel. Uh, we also obviously use uh, solar cookers um, and um, then we set off to create some new buildings uh, uh, because the shelter was very limited that we had. So luckily we could enroll, uh, some, of, enroll some of our family, the son that's an architect and friends around, so we created um, blueprints for buildings um, on the farm and our first uh, building that we built was, of course, a, a compost toilet. Um, that uh, um, again, we wanted to use as little water as possible. It's probably the the most absurd way of using water is to flush down your waste. Your your feces is only about three percent solid matter. The rest is water. So to flush that with away with water is an absolute lunacy. Um, it's actually a crap design. It was developed by a, a guy called Thomas Crap. Um, <laughs> so it, it is um, yeah, true to the word, I guess. Yeah, to his name. Um, we had a, an old crawl on the farm, uh, and there's a stretch tent of one of our first volunteers there. She came with a caravan and 10 dogs and a couple of cats uh, for a while. She worked with us, it was quite wonderful. Um, so yeah, we we worked, uh, we created a because one of the first things, of course, we wanted to bring in cows. No biodynamic farm without cows, but we'll get to that a little later. And then we utilize what's called super adobe uh, building. Super adobe, adobe is just another word for earth or soil. Um, so these are bags, uh, any bags you could take, but we used uh, long sausages. Um, that we fill with soil and then we, we ran them together. So one of the first buildings we built is uh, a dome because we don't really need a, uh, a roof structure. It's a self-supporting self -supporting structure. Um, we also utilized local knowledge of plastering. This is Mafusi, one of our serial volunteers and now also director. Um, she, uh, coming from Lesotho, had great skill, and her mother kept on uh, upskilling her of, uh, for, for the mud plasters within it. Uh, it got uh, waterproofed, a sort of waterproof. We're still building, and now 
And then I thought I'll, I'll find a nice uh, color that fits into the landscape, but it's different. <laughs> May I announce we are we are repainting it shortly. Um, obviously, we wanted to make this also relevant for for our local context. Um, the uh, there is still a, a hell of a lot of tin shacks in our uh, community. They are very few. Uh, well, they are is RTP housing, but they're just as energy inefficient as the tin shacks. Um, so we built on that same footprint of six by three meters a um, a little a dwelling uh, in three weeks uh, that was done. We luckily we had some French volunteers, some scouts uh, arrived there at the same time that they helped us in in plastering um, and finishing off that little building. And uh, yeah, it's got a beautiful feel. On the inside, uh, it's warm in the winter, it's cool in the summer, um, and uh, yeah, it serves us very well. Um, so we we did a lot of excavation with um, the, 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 the excavator during our first, so we leveled out for nurseries and so on. And we always are looking to uh, create more ponds. Even if they if they are vernal ponds, so that means they just they fill up in the summer and wildlife will um, um, come and uh, utilize the water that is there. So the more we create this this uh, wetland and, and pond oasis, uh, um, the more whole the landscape will become. So uh, a lot of that is uh, from that from uh, digging ponds. Yeah, so we also got some uh, funding from uh, from the Oppenheimer Generations um, Fund, uh, the, the Broad Trust, and we've started with our future volunteer and student hub. We are at the um, at the, the foundation level so far. Okay, come, that's it. Oops, all right, it was a bit slow. Um, but we also always, of course, want to use when we, we, we don't just employ people, we create a learnership around um, uh, the, the things we do on the land. So we had three young men from the local community that were um, trained for a year um, uh, to do uh, this, to really learn building from scratch, from putting on uh, plants onto the ground, um, uh, foundations, very important, the uh, rubble trench foundations, because uh, um, the, um, the mountains in the area, they ooze water for many, many months a year, not just during the rainy season. So there's always moisture at the bottom. Um, yeah. Uh, here we go. This is uh, the kitchen and the pollution block that we are busy doing foundations for. And you can see very nicely how it's uh, in fact. Uh, it's basically ram earth, but uh, in a very simple, simple way. And yes, you can see it here. Um, in this uh, picture at the top right. Um, so it, it's a, a technology that was de developed by an Iranian architect, Nader Khalili. He founded the Cal Earth Institute in California, and he was basically tasked to create a building system that uh, they could take up to the moon and to Mars and whatever. So bags and um, and barbed wire is very light because there's enough sand or regolith on the moon that uh, they can fill these things with. It obviously never made it there, but uh, it made it into many of the disaster areas of um, uh, earthquake zones all around the world, and um, they, uh, yeah, they are almost indestructible. Because, uh, and so, between each layer of bags, there is a strand of barbed wire that holds the bag so that they don't shift. Only everything. Yes. All of so every you see two strands depending on how wide they are. Um, yes. So there's barbed wire in there, and that holds the bag yeah. nicely so that they don't shift around. 
Um, other things, of course, we, we live in Rosendahl, uh, of course, outside Rosendahl, and there is uh, um, a good drinking culture there in the, in the restaurants and, and little spots there. So we, we are the, the local bottle uh, removers um, because we build with it. We build stem walls, uh, retaining walls. Instead of bricks, we use bottles. Um, and uh, and then on the on the spot of walls, for example, we uh, we then uh, uh, start with our super adobe um, uh, bags. So the bottles go to sand. Was yes. No, no. The bottles are, are empty. They're empty. Yes. And then on top of this, you put your your, your bag. That's right. Yes. How is that secure? I mean, empty bottles are not secure. No, they they're very very. Um, uh, they're very strong. It's a round bottle. It, it has integrity, um, and we of course do use uh, rather thick bottles, thick, uh, um, you know, wine bottles, mm -hmm. uh, champagne bottles, um, no. well, all yeah. bottles, in fact. But depending on on how much stress is there, we choose uh, choose the bottle. And how do you stick them together? With cement or with, with a lime plaster, yes, yeah. So we've also um, so where that stretch tent was was we've uh, started building a, a workshed again. It was a training exercise. Um, the walls gone up. They're plastered with um, with, a, with a lime plaster rather than cement plaster. And another copper toilet uh, being built, um, and that gives us uh, indoor space uh, to work with. Other building practices, we did foundations for our geodesic domes. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see a little bit more how that pans out and what they're going to be. Um, so the next, the last of the mainframe design uh, issues was of course road access. And, uh, and because we have quite a bit of mountains, about 80 hectares of the 120 hectares is mountainous, so we need to get up there, um, you know, to to uh, service um, the this, this springs to be able to go there if there's felt fires and so on. So after all of this mainframe design and interest and development, we now had. Uh, we're ready to put a bit more effort into um, our agriculture. And agriculture really um, should be seen as that, as a culture of working with the land, a culture of working with people on the land. Um, so right from the outset, I guess, um, uh, we, we started utilizing biodynamic practices. and. Biodynamics, as I said earlier, um, is something that perhaps is not grasped so easily because it works with invisible forces, let me say it that way. So um, it, it works with the 97% of the non-visible spectrum of uh, energies. You know, we through, I guess, a Darwinian materialistic um, uh, a world model, we come to only value what we can weigh or measure, and that is part of the 3% of the visible spectrum that we have. Um, but the rest we very often neglect, and that's where then our cognitive dissonance comes in, because we can't see it or can't touch it, it is not relevant, it is not there. Um, I guess biodynamics, although was uh, um, almost coincided with the um, the discovery or the, the development of quantum physics um, where the observer of a phenomena is uh, intimately linked to that phenomena and in, uh, is not we can't separate ourselves from from the phenomena so the biodynamics very much works with um, the resonances and the processes um, uh, that are there in the world and that we can enhance through certain materials or vibrations. Rudolf Schein has always said that biodynamics, that he has given a 
um, an indication of, of a direction of what, how to do a modern agriculture. Um, and uh, for that, at the time, he gave uh, a set of preparations that we utilize within an agriculture, that uh, those preparations are sheathed in certain animal or plant sheaths and exposed to the rhythms of the season, uh, for example, and the rhythms of the earth, the rhythms of the cosmos. Um, and it might all sound like voodoo, uh, because I guess voodoo also is based on the same on the same principles. Yeah. yeah. So they they also work with um, with those invisible forces. Um, but Stein always uh, um, emphasized that this needs to be further developed. So how does biodynamics look like in the 21st century in going forward? Is it just of us taking certain substances and spreading it over the land? You can see in the middle, in the middle picture there, we've stirred a preparation. It's called a warm and new preparation. Uh, I've got a little flow form set up with a solar panel, and it, it stirs uh, the preparation for an hour, and it makes it active. It is almost like a, a homeopathic uh, a potentization that happens um, where um, a substance can be um, multiplied or, or increased in strength through a certain rhythmical process. Uh, Measure down here on the bottom right, uh, bottom left, um, is stirring the preparations with, with his hat, with his hands, um, and then we, that gets sprayed out over the land. Um, but there are uh, fantastic thinkers that have been around, and uh, one of them was Hugh Lovell. We had the the, the, the great fortune of hosting in 2017, I think, in, in the free state. Um, and he had a company that was called Quantum Agriculture. And he was a fantastic biodynamic farmer and practitioner and consultant, both in Australia and in the States. And he works a lot with radionics. So he's taken this concept of, uh, of the, the vibrational um, distribution of um, of a, a substance and taking it one step further in broadcasting it through a, you could call it a machine, a, a radionics instrument. Um, so there's other great thinkers that have taken that further, like um, uh, Glenn Atkins in, uh, with Garuda Biodynamics in New Zealand. Seems that the antipodes are doing very well in uh, taking this uh, his thought processes forward. So um, we also on the farm we work very much uh, with the resonance and the vibrations of, of biodynamics. And yes, we do. You see me putting in preparations into the compost heap up there. So we do use the the actual physical substances that then disseminate their vibrations into the environment, but we also are looking at um, uh, utilizing different technologies. And biodynamics has a great, has a strong relationship with detected microorganisms, or EM, a technology that was developed in, in Japan, um, and uh, uh, we utilize it um, uh, in all realms of, of life, it's beneficial microbes that are uh, in a very rounded concoction, you could say, of uh, different uh, families, and they enhance uh, the life processes, uh, be that in animal, in human gut, in the soil, in everywhere, everywhere where, where balancing is needed. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the, the first or biggest proponents of uh, biodynamics in, in the, the States, uh, Ehrenfried Pfeiffer, uh, who was sent there by Rudolf Steiner personally, um, he uh, influenced uh, Professor Higa very strongly with, uh, with his developmental work in effective microorganisms. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful link that has happened there. So yeah, what else do we do? Of course, we are making hay while the sun shines, um, utilizing that in our crawl because uh, 
the crawl is the heart um, of the form. That's where the nutrients get captured, both the urine and uh, the manure uh, of the animals. And then we make compost um, where we're using uh, yeah, volunteers from all over the world. Um, the local contingent is a little bit thin on the ground still. Uh, South Africans don't really know what volunteering means. Um, uh, so yeah, and composting is a is a big, and we do different um, uh, processes. Uh, it's a, it's a big um, uh, focus point, of course, of any um, uh, of any regenerative agricultural pro uh, form. We also very quickly wanted to put up a nursery uh, because I've got a great interest in, in developing plants that work for that, that high mountain, uh, cold, free state um, environment. And, uh, you know, it's not, um, we can't just take a European or North American plant here and think that it then works because we have got this wonderful fluctuations during the daytime in the winter, you know. So you wake up at night with minus 13 and by lunchtime uh, it can be 15 or 20 degrees outside. So mm -hmm. not many European plants or North northern hemisphere plants uh, really uh, cope with that. So this was the area where we built our, our nursery. Uh, we created a platform and then, of course, put up a structure and this is... Uh, um, also, it's another heart, I guess, of the farm where we experiment, where we grow, where a lot of activity happens uh, all the time. Um, because of the harsh climate, of course, we also wanted to have uh, some season extension and protection from the cold. I mean, last uh, year we had only four months without frost. Um, so. Uh, the, 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 the frost-free season is very, uh, very short. Um, so, yeah, we built, uh, of course, a greenhouse again quickly. Um, luckily, I had a friend that had a company that uh, built geodesic domes for uh, exhibitions and raves, and we managed to get hold of, of a few. Um, uh, this is what it looks like inside now. So I've got some uh, interesting citrus uh, plants growing there, bananas, apart, of course, from um, uh, the nursery, and uh, even some uh, logs that we inoculated with um, uh, mushroom mycelium uh, from a very good friend in Durban that provides it for us. Our big dome, 11 meter in diameter, um, uh, is another experimental station for us. Um, I want, uh, I've done a lot of work again in Etiquini with uh, an aquaculture, uh, aquaculture system there. And I want to, well, we are experimenting with aquaponics, which is a system that works with fish and the fish water feeds the, the plants. <laughs> We've probably all heard of hydroponics, which is just a water-based system where nutrients just get flushed to the roots of plants, and you can create beautiful plants with very little nutrition. Um, uh, because, I mean, we still have this, um, this arrogance where we think uh, we can emulate a nutrition system just with, in the laboratory, and we think NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and maybe a few little trace elements will create a fully nutritional um, a food for us. Um, the state of health of our world, uh, people that eat that food, uh, shows a different picture. Um, yeah, this thing, I guess this morning, it looked uh, like this. I put all these citruses that I planted inside. Um, there's no fish tanks yet. It's uh, just recently we put up the, the cover on the, on the big dome. Um, uh, and uh, at the moment, we are, I've got my tree nursery in there as well, um, that they get moved out as soon as it gets a little bit warmer, and then we can build our raised beds and wicking beds in there. Mm -hmm. 
the water comes from the dam or from the spring. Yes, depending if the springs uh, touch wood, it was has never failed us. But uh, for that reason, we also have a little stream that goes past the farm and um, and the dams. Yeah. So vegetable garden was very important, very quickly, I guess. So that was one of the first things. In fact, even before I moved on, uh, honest who has been the, 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 the very trusty gardener there for oof, 16, 17 years, um, he started uh, double digging uh, before we even moved on. Um, and uh, and created uh, we put that in, in an area where the soil was uh, the most fertile. We thought uh, also through soil analysis um, we that it was determined that way. So yeah, early days again zero volunteer course uh, brother-in-law. He comes a couple of months uh, every couple of years. So um, the fantastic horticulturist that assists us. Um, greatly. So, beautiful fertility, beautiful growth, uh, but of course now it's winter, this is how it looked this morning. Mm -hmm. We have to cover everything, uh, even our garlic and our onions and of course the, the cabbage family, uh, because the wildlife is very hungry all around and uh, they even graze the garlic all the way to the ground. Yeah. Planting trees, yes. The, the, uh, speaking to the fourth principle of a regenerative agriculture, put in woody crops, our perennials. So we've planted lots of fruit trees, nut trees, and support trees. Well, even uh, a tea tree, <laughs> which is now huge uh, and gets all the washing machine water because it's actually a swamp plant. So we've planted our food forest below the swale, like I've learned it in the book. Uh, not thinking that in that soil, these poor roots just don't get enough oxygen. and They get, um, um, uh, they suffocate. Uh, so a lot of learning has happened there. There's a few poor stragglers that are left, but in the meantime, uh, all our swales are planted on the top now. Um, the felt, got improved through our beautiful animals, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we oversowed uh, certain areas, uh, added new uh, plants, um, uh, multi-species in of legumes, uh, and even some grasses. And of course, we're grazing with animals. Animals really belong to our ecological system. It's grassland. Grasslands evolve with grazes. Um, in fact, the, the farm hasn't had any grazes on the land, so the grasslands actually deteriorated over that time. Um, so that's why we brought uh, animals in, that with the, the action of their hooves, they create a um, this disturb the capping of the soil um, and uh, they obviously um, graze the um, the, the top um, down and then the, the roots die back from the bottom and that creates more organic matter in the soil and then it regrows. So you have this, this movement happening um, of uh, of grazing from the top, cutting back from the bottom, and then uh, through that increasing um, the life within the soil. So we brought in uh, some guni cows, uh, four cows, um, very early. It's interesting, in, uh, on a neighboring farm, about 20 minutes walk from us, there's a beautiful overhang with, uh, with paintings, uh, uh, rock paintings on there, and there's one can see, of course, some of them in the airline, like over there. There's certainly cattle and herders around there as well. So, cattle have been part of that landscape for uh, many, um, many centuries. And of course, our cattle have horns, um, so we can't really have a truly regenerative uh, agriculture with mutilated animals. And any cow that hasn't got 
that its horns been taken off is a mutilated animal. Um, um, not just from a biodynamic point of view, but just from a um, animal welfare point of view. If you ever um, have looked at the at the um, cow skull, so there's actually a horn um, extension that comes from the skull that goes out, um, a, a, a bone extension over which the horn sits. And within that that, that um, uh, bone is an uh, intricate network of cavities. So the sinuses are connected into the horns, and it's actually a communication um, system that the cow has, not just from a esoteric point of view that Steiner very clearly um, explains in the agricultural course, but even in a um, in a purely uh, physical uh, way, you can once you get to know your cow, just the slightest movement, the way it turns its head, the way the, the, the horns move in in the three dimensional directions, it communicates to the others and to me um, very often strongly. Um, that I'm accepted or not really uh, asked to please step away and not interfere with uh, the most important grazing or whatever. So the the, the homes are, are very important. I've heard one biodynamic farmer in Switzerland, he was telling me that it's uh, cutting off a horn is like the equivalent of cutting out a tongue from a human being. So we can't communicate uh, very well without a tongue, so a, a, an, uh, a cow can't really communicate very well without horns. So, and of course, it always um, is um, uh, uh, that there is a big uh, within our vegetarian and vegan um, communities. There's always this question: Why are we keeping animals? Uh, and uh, well, I've already shared one reason: that grassland need uh, grazers. Um, uh, and but it's it's the way we are using those grazers that's important. So those um, are adjoining farms. The difference is that uh, on the on the right hand side, it's. Um, there's uh, a holistic grazing management happening, and on the other side, it's a blanket um, grazing, a continuous grazing happening there. So, in a managed grazing, it is like in in Africa, all over the place. It was that uh, that pastoralists would uh, graze their herds in certain areas for only a certain time. So that's obviously. Um, uh, taken from uh, the, the natural grazers or the, uh, the original grazers in the, in the savannas and grasslands where huge herds of grazers come, they eat, eat, trample, trample, shit, shit, and then they move on and they don't come back for many, many months. And in that time, the grassland can regenerate and the soils can improve. Um, so we try to emulate that, I guess. And uh, and of course there's this difference of very often we, we confuse uh, you know uh, meat eating or be, uh, growing meat animals with is cat cattle so concentrated animal feed operations which is completely uh, contrary and degenerative to a plant grazing where you can see in the other pictures. The, the cattle are held with their electric fencing in a certain area and they graze there and um, uh, do their, do what they need to do and then move on. Um, of course, we also got horses there, but they're uh, really just on pension there. Um, one always likes to have different grazing ways of grazing, of ways of cutting grass, I guess, and, and the horses have quite a different way of um, of utilizing grass, and they're not as fussy as the cows. Um, and they eat like 23 hours a day or something. So they're all the time out there, and they produce uh, 
um, wonderful stuff that comes out beneath their tail um, that they spread all over the, the landscape or in our crawl as well. They, they live very closely with the, the cows. So I'm uh, almost running out of time here. I'll hurry up. So we have poultry um, and then we have some other uh, people on the farm. Um, and uh, we always wanted to be a intentional community right from the beginning. We are going through phases. At the moment, we're very small, uh, but we're hoping that that will increase. Um, and when you bury another a wonderful uh, thinker and writer and farmer, um, really sums it up beautifully uh, what he has, to, he considers a community on the land. So, as I said, we have volunteers from all over the world, um, and uh, they they are the life um, that comes in and out. Uh, we very much work with our local community, and um, that's our, as I said, our raison d'être. Um, we give short courses, we have uh, open days, um, we engage on, on various levels with the, the, the local community. We've even had uh, one of them uh, have a piece of land on the farm uh, to grow a crop, to experience um, a, a cropping cycle uh, one of the years. We have a local market uh, that we attend um, and we've made attempts to work with the schools um, that's more or less uh, successful, uh, a little less at the moment, but uh, it all takes time. We also take uh, tours with, uh, with interested people throughout systems, uh, especially around uh, uh, Johannesburg here and a little bit north uh, to look at uh, systems that have been implemented and work, work well. Yes. Pigs. Yes, free range pigs. It's a, a wonderful um, story, uh, but it would, well, <laughs> it's Hendrik, uh, in, uh, is, you could say, almost a refugee from Zimbabwe. Uh, he lost his farm there. He came with nothing to, uh, to uh, Bella Bella, just south of Bella Bella. He started with eight pigs or something. Uh, and did regenerative grazing on, on just on a, a small plot. And he increased, she, he started increasing the fertility around 800 free range pigs. Now they're moved every day, um, with a very simple, very beautiful system. So anybody interested, uh, he is, he welcomes people to come, uh, visit as well. This is a, a truly inspiring system. And that's uh, one of the next ones that will go up. Uh, on our farm as well. You're going to take the pigs also? Yes. <laughs> Free range pigs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, other community engagements that we do. Um, and uh, we've basically developed two primary training initiatives uh, uh, on the farm now that we are promoting. That's the natural building and the food growing um, uh, uh, training. We've developed a, an interesting pilot system that's been funded now by the Foundation for Human Rights, where we're starting uh, with a very small uh, implementation within uh, the local community, where we're just taking three people um, that get trained on the farm, and then we help them to establish their uh, little food growing system um, in in Maozi, we work with wicking baits because of the they very often don't like four days a week they don't have water so we do in ground and in container growing in uh, greenhouses that we build ourselves so that they build themselves um, so it's all uh, systems that can be easily duplicated. So a view of one of our volunteers last year he quickly sketched. <laughs> Yeah, but he's a very gifted young man, uh, landscape architect that uh, yeah, 
just uh, had had the gift. So this is basically what I wanted to share with you today. Mm. And to round off our swale that hosts all different wildlife as well, and even our geese could learn some air ice skating in the winter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, a question. Have at the beginning um, the seed, um, not, not a tunnel, but you built something or I, I heard that you wanted to collect GM free seeds. Well, we, um, again, seed saving is a, is a very important part of any. Um, uh, Regenerative agricultural system, I guess, and, and especially in our in the rural areas, for to regenerate uh, rural uh, economies and ecologies, um, uh, we want open pollination seeds. So that means non-hybridized seeds, so you can save over time. Um, luckily, there is not that much, um, uh, not that many GMO. Varieties of or seeds around, so it's basically maize, um, soybean, canola, uh, and a few others that are GMO. But those are basically you, uh, industrial uh, uh, agriculture uses them mainly. Um, so um, the uh, our emphasis is on, I guess, uh, on open pollinated seed. But we we as such don't have a special program that works with it. It's just part of our of our uh, that you, you you what you grow you take seeds from. That's right, yes. And yep. that's how the indigenous farming used to do it from whenever I That's right, it. yes. And then when I have seed swaps so where you can share seeds uh, all around. Yes. But this is illegal. no. <laughs> It isn't. They're trying to make it illegal, but um, uh, I think uh, Uganda is has put out a law, Tanzania, as far as I know, um, but it's not going to work in Africa. I'm sorry. Uh, many things are illegal, and uh, <laughs> luckily we are, we are resilient people, yes. Any other questions? That there's any maize growing in South Africa still without GM? No, there is. In, uh, in fact, there is uh, a growing uh, uh, community of even of industrial farmers that are growing non GMO maize because they've seen um, the you know the, the the promises of the the corporations have not come through. Yeah. So there, there there is not the the greater yield. There is. Um, uh, there is a certain stigma attached as well already, and of course, uh, people, are, um, you know, have health concerns as well with uh, with the GMO. Yeah, so there uh, is. So a there is. Consciousness of that. Yes, there is. In the agricultural world, we talk yes, about. yeah. Uh, there is also there's already beautiful large regenerative farms. I mean, around Waterville, for example, big maize growing area in. Uh, in the free state, there is uh, a numerous uh, regenerative farmers there that grow maize on, uh, you know, multi cropping on 3,000 hectares, for example. Yes. So, um, regenerative agriculture doesn't need to be on 20 hectares yes. or on 10 hectares. It can, the, the system uh, is the same. The, the, the system focuses on, on, the, on the, the fertility, the health of the soil, and that is done through a multi crop system. Um, yeah. Have you got any contact with uh, in, in, in the free state with interest? Yes. Of similar uh, ideas and, and not necessarily doing what you do, but in that direction. Yes, it's starting. Uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a hard slog because the the corporate corporations and the corporati they are very strong in. Uh, in the free state, and uh, the, you know the um, the conversion to to a regenerative system needs to start here first before it ha happens anywhere else. And uh, yeah, so it's um, uh, a slow process, but there are people around, and there is uh, there's a big regenerative uh, movement happening uh, 
encourage yes amazing work and would like to visit one day just wondering about the cost of all of this the sight of seeing excavator alone for weeks must have been expensive for a regular bloke like me it seems unreachable how do you convince a farmer with no funding on a two hectare farm <laughs> Very good question. Um, in fact, we we work on a on a complete shoestring um, uh, budget. Uh, yes, we did have, as I said earlier, an angel donor, um, but it's small step. You know, the first principle of permaculture is start at your back door. Um, so utilize uh, YouTube. Utilize the, there is so much free resources. Go on to Jeff Lawton's uh, Discover Permaculture. Uh, go on to Permaculture Apprentice. Uh, all of these, uh, they give you, uh, there's wonderful resources around them. Just uh, um, uh, start small, start, as I said, start at, at your back door. And yes, uh, if you're not uh, scared to stay over in a tent, you're welcome to, to come. We, our accommodation is still very sparse, but uh, all our volunteers stay in, uh, in tents and yeah, visitors are welcome. And does the Oppenheimer fund support the region? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Strilly Oppenheimer is. Strilly comes from that uh, uh, in England. From yeah, so she has got a, a, an organic <laughs> farm in, uh, in in England, but uh, you know, even they're, they're, they're very big proponents of the, the whole Mooney. Uh, yeah. Cattle story. I think they got 13,000 yeah. cattle in Zimbabwe, and uh, so they, yeah, they do it on a different scale, but they they were very supportive uh, in some of our work too. Yes. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, if you need want any more info, go to www.vipo.co.za or scdpermaculture.org.za. Um, and you can contact me through that um, those channels. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this insightful adventure. We look forward to welcoming you to Anthroposophical Conversations, where together we will unlock timeless wisdom and discover new horizons of understanding. Stay tuned for our upcoming episodes as we unravel the secrets of the human experience and delve into the extraordinary world of Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy.